Okie dokie. So this is the third lecture on the chapter of um, birth, childbirth, and the newborn. Uh, this conversation is going to start with the stages of labor and delivery, and then probably move in to talk about some of the jargon, uh, or some of the terms, I'm sorry, of the newborn and the meaning of the APGAR. So that's all this, this slide is about, um, is about the three stages and to know effectively what's going on during each of these stages of labor. Um, this term paturation refers to the first for the two weeks before, you have probably 38 weeks to 40 weeks about, with 266 days after conception. This would be a time where a woman might experience um, false labor or Braxton Hicks, which is, I actually don't know where that term comes from. Um, I remember that during the stage, I went to the doctor thinking that I was in labor and it turned out I'd just been peeing myself, uh, which is another thing that happens during this, during this stage. Um, so the, those two weeks before labor. The first stage is actually, so here's the quiz question, is what stage of labor and delivery does the child pass through the birth canal? And the answer to that is the second stage. The first stage is where the cervix, which is really pretty small, has to expand to, oh my goodness, I should know how many inches it has to get in order to allow for the baby's head to come out. So she's got this cork, she's got this mucus cork, that's keeping everything, um, everything in the in the uterus, right? As it gets increasingly heavy with fluid, sometimes some women have a hard time keeping the fluid in the uterus that needs to be there in order to sustain and to bathe the bathe the unborn. And that's what that cork is about. When her water breaks, um, that is when the uterus, that is when that cork pops out and all of the fluid or some of the fluid begins to, uh, yeah, basically washes, washes over her. Um, trying to think, sometimes women have, I don't know the technical term for this either, but they have a weak cervix and um, it, it doesn't stay shut like it's supposed to and they might actually put seam, put stitches into her cervix. Of course, those stitches then have to be taken out. The cervix is a remarkable little structure it will heal itself if it's damaged. Um, you know, back in the 70s, they were advocating for women to get to know their bodies and to stand over a mirror and to feel what that cervix feels like. And um, anyway, um, you know, whatever, I'll move on. Stage two, so stage two, where this is where the baby passes through the birth canal. Um, contractions get more intense, they get closer together. And this would be the time during delivery where they would cut the um, they would cut the um, peritoneum. Yeah, it would be the episiotomy. The third stage is not, like I say, when the child passes through, but this is the stage where the placenta is expelled. And the placenta is that, you know, is the bloody tissue that has held all the nutrients. And so this is when it passes through the birth canal. In some traditions, they keep the placenta. Apparently, you can, there are organizations where you can send your placenta off to and it will be made into, um, it will be dried and powdered and put back into um, tablet form or capsule form because it's really, really rich in nutrients. Animals eat their placenta because it has so much um, vitamins and blood and protein. It's just, it's just rich. Um, it's certainly, okay, my opinion is it does kind of seem a waste, you know, just to put it into the medical disposal. So that's often a fun conversation, you know, if we were face to face, you know, to talk about all the different things you can do with your placenta. Um, there's also um, some organizations want to store your, um, the blood, your umbilical cord blood, um, because it's thought to have a lot of stem cells. Stem cells. Okay, so moving right along, lots of lots of different interesting. And again, uh, you know what I'm interested in are what are the ancient practices that have been done? What what have women been doing for millennia when it wasn't about insurance and money? Okay, the newborn. Uh, the newborn. The term for a newborn between four and six weeks is a neonate. So you'll hear that referred to you know, a lot of, of the neonate. Here's some statistics. You know, you got your average 20 inches, seven and a half pounds, 95% um, of them, as I say, 95% weigh somewhere in there. 
a, a way between five and a half and 10 pounds. My daughter was like exactly average. <laughs> she was just perfectly average. Um, I weighed 10 pounds. Now, I was also a month late, you know, 17 days late, and that, they probably don't do that. They don't let you go that far past term. One of the reasons you don't is that the placenta begins to break down. So it's, uh, it's kind of like an overripe, you know, produce. If it grows too long, it's not better, but it begins to get worse. And so the placenta can begin to break down if the baby is not born at a certain point. Here's some fun terms. You got the fontanelle, that's a soft spot in the head because all the bones in the head have not yet fused. Um, my understanding is this is, um, allows for the, for the head to kind of get mushed together so it can go through the birth canal. A lot of babies will have like a cone shaped head um, because they've spent too long in the birth canal. Um, cesarean section babies don't have this. And I've heard nurse friends say that they can tell a baby with cesarean or vaginal birth by the shape of their head. Uh, but that soft spot, it heals. I'm not actually, I don't know how long it takes to heal. The font or the um, this word right here, the lengu, lengu. This is a, a fuzzy sort of hair. Um, you'll see more of it on premature babies, and it acts as like an insulator. It acts to keep their bodies warm. Um, severely anorexic people also have some of this. They'll, they'll grow this fur back when they don't have enough body fat to keep them warm. This term right here refers to kind of a, there's a picture in your textbook and you can kind of see it, how babies are born with this kind of goo, this kind of white varnishy light goo on them. The oily is um, a cheesy varnish, which is acts to protect the, uh, acts to protect the skin. Then you have a, what's something that sometimes is referred to as a witch's milk. And this is a vaginal discharge that girl babies will have. Now this has to do with the mother's estrogen with all of her hormones, because remember all of the hormones that she's experiencing, baby is experiencing too. Sometimes baby boys will have like a, they'll have like a nip, like a discharge at their nipples. And this is sort of, it's the same thing. It's the female hormones from their mother that are cycling through their own bodies. Um, you got some, what to say, some other terms over here. Um, oh, phooey. Uh, and an oxo, where there's not enough, there's no oxygen in the blood, and then you have hypoxia, there's not enough oxygen in the blood. Of course, this is critical because the child is not getting the, the oxygen from their mother anymore. Um, there may not be enough oxygen to the brain. Um, some fun terms, um, infant poop, right? This is the, this is the first um, indication that their bowels are moving properly. It's like really black and tarry. Now, my son had a birth defect that affected his intestines and his, uh, yeah, affected his intestines and his inability to poop. And so the, the doctors actually kept his first poop for us. Jaundice is a kind of a yellowish orangey um, tint to complexion. And it is a product of having an immature liver. So a lot, it's very, very common. Um, nothing to be concerned about if it fades quite quickly. And usually they'll put babies in like a light. They'll put them under a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, like a full spectrum light and, and their body will absorb whatever it is. Oh, I should know. But their body will absorb what needs to be absorbed so that yellowish complexion goes away. Okay, this is a exam question. It's a quiz question. I know if you're going into nursing, or if you're going even into the medical technician side, you'll have to know this. I saw it on her chalkboard or on her whiteboard the other day, and that is the APGAR scale. Um, you need to know what it stands for. And this is a very quick, immediately after birth assessment of a baby's well being. There's another one um, that's referred to in your book as well. That is the um, behavioral assessment, that's the Brazelton neonatal assessment. Um, and you can find these scores in your textbook. I'm looking on page 94. But APGAR stands for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. This is a very straightforward assessment. Um, and, it, and it can be it's scored on each of these criteria on a zero to two. So the highest score you can get is a 10 the lowest is a zero. So if a child has below a four, they're in immediate distress. If it's, if it's somewhere between 10, seven and 10, 
that's considered a pretty good score. I will tell you that my child, my son, when he was born, and again, his intestines were on the outside of his body, he even had a six, right? I mean, so his, I don't know what those would have been that would have given him a six. In some ways, um, I know, he, I think he was crying. Anyway, so you can, you can see this. That will be an exam question. What does APGAR stand for? Appearance, and what are our choices over here? What's our appearance score? Hmm, <laughs> this one doesn't have appearance, does it? Uh, pulse, grimace is like if they poke them, you know, do they respond? Activity, are they moving around or are they limp? And then respiration refers to if they are breathing, um, if they are crying, heart rate, color. Hmm, that one doesn't look quite like the same one that's in your textbook. In your textbook, it has appearance, blue or pale, pulse rate, grimace as if they are reflex, activity, and respiration. Okay, this is a good place for me to start. Uh, I'm sorry, for me to stop. And when we come back, we'll talk about some of the risks that are associated with being born. <laughs>